Hey guys, welcome back to another video in this channel. My name is Abraham Leal, and uh, today we're going to be talking about a very interesting topic. Now, there were several questions throughout this last couple of days, uh, and there was one that really caught my attention where a couple of people actually mentioned that they want to know what's the difference or what what does each map do? Like, wh how, why do we need so many maps in the 3D world? And what's the, f the main, like, objective or function of each map, okay? So I'm actually going to be showing you this inside of Substance because it's going to be a little bit easier for me to, to show you. And I'm going to be using a sample file here. So let's use this. Or actually, no, I'm, I'm going to use one of my own files. So let's import an object here. I'm going to create a new project. And let's do... Uh, yeah, this uh, I wanted to do like an object. So let me let me see what do I have over here. Oh, the Diwali lamp. Yeah, I think that the Diwali lamp is a it's a well, actually that's a little bit a little bit too simple. So let me see. Let's let's grab one of our our guises here. So we did the firefly. You you guys remember the firefly that we did? Yeah. So there we go. Now this one, uh, the only thing is it's made in Udim, in, in Udims. So we have uh, three Udims here. Uh, shouldn't be that much of a problem. But actually, let me create a new project, and I'm gonna make sure that this is using Udems. Just to, just ignore the, the Udem thing. Um, it's 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 just something a little bit more advanced. If you want to check it out, go back into one of our uh, videos. I believe when we were doing this Firefly, I explained a little bit more in depth. So, there's two types of maps inside of the 3D world. One of those categories of maps is called a mesh map. And the other category of map is inside of the PBR texturing workflow, okay? So let's talk about the mesh maps first. Whenever you go into Substance Painter and a lot of uh, softwares uh, out there, there's gonna be this process that we use to generate uh, this channels, right? Like, or not this channels, this channels right here. So the normal map, the space, world space normal, ID map, occlusion map, uh, curvature map, position map, and thickness map. And each of these maps, what they are, it's information. They, they contain information about the object that, we're, uh, that we have here. So I'm gonna do a quick bake here, and we actually don't have any high poly to bake from, uh, which is a, kind of like a bad thing. We should have one. Let me select something else. Let me go and do, what, what did we do here that was um, a little bit more like high poly, low poly thing? Can't remember, Aku Aku. Yeah, Aku Aku was this one, right? Yeah, you be ready, let's see. Let's discard this. Yeah, so if you remember, yeah, okay, perfect. Aku Aku, when we did this tutorial, if you haven't seen this one, also go into our playlist and you, you should be able to find this. We took some of the meshes from this object into ZBrush and we added a little bit of detail and we created something called a high poly. Now, you don't always need to go into ZBrush to create this high poly. You can actually do it in Maya and do a lot of crazy stuff. Uh, so I'm just gonna grab this guy right here, say open. And what's gonna happen is I'm gonna generate, like I'm gonna extract information from the high poly and the low poly, and I'm gonna generate all of these maps. So the normal map is a RGB map. Okay, let's start with that one, that's, that's the first map. So the normal map, it's an RGB map uh, that conveys information of how the surface should look. However, this will not displace the surface, so it won't move like vertices up and down. It's just like an illusion that it that tells the camera how the, the surface should render, even though you're not moving anything. So the normal maps are really helpful because we are able to create something called low polys, like the one that we have right now in, in Substance Painter, and we are able to imprint a lot of uh, detailed information that makes it look super high quality without the need to have as many uh, polygons. So that's that's the normal map. The world space normal is gonna tell the object where all of the faces are facing, okay? So all of the faces that are facing forward are gonna be painted uh, blue. All of the faces that are uh, facing upwards are gonna be painted uh, green. And then all of the faces that are facing to the right and to the left are gonna be painted red. And I uh, have uh, like a variation of color in between those three colors, okay? So, why do we need a world space normal? Well, we need to know where faces are facing so that we can add specific details that gather that information. So if, for instance, we have like a car that's been out in the in the outdoors for a long time and we wanna add a, a layer of dust, we need to know which faces are pointing up so that all of the dust settles exactly on those faces, right? To get a like, nice uh, transition. So that's what the world space normal does. The ID map is a map that I don't use super often, I do use it, but not right now, or not at least not in this one right here. And the ID map, what this will do is um, it will create colors or masks that are gonna be easy to select. So especially when you have like super complex objects like this thing right here, and you don't wanna be like 
hand painting all of the masks that you need to like create different sections of the object, creating an ID mask is really good. And it's just a vertex color. You can actually like, if you use poly paint inside of ZBrush, that is an ID mask. And that information gets stored in the high poly and the uh, substance knows about this and it gathers that information so that we can create masks a little bit more easily. It's uh, one of the things that, that we do. We're actually gonna be using ID masks or something similar um, for the lighthouse project later on, uh, once we get into the, into the wall textures. Uh, then ambient occlusion, one of my favorite maps. And this one's super helpful because it's, it's, it is it is not only used for um, for like a texturing where, where the dirt's gonna be or where the dust and things are gonna settle and, and get like accumulated. You can actually export this map and then use it on the on the engine or your render and multiply it against your texture to give a little bit a, a little bit of an extra contrast to the whole thing. So super, super useful. And as the name implies, ambient occlusion is where um, the ambient itself, the objects of, an, of a scene, occlude each other. So where light has a harder time getting into like the crevices and then like nooks and crannies, like all of the, those sections where light won't bounce as easily, that's the ambient occlusion. Super, super helpful to get that, that like little extra, extra contrast here and there. Uh, then we have the curvature, which is super important as well. The curvature map will tell us which areas of our object are concave and which areas of our object are convex. Um, uh, Substance uses a black and white map. So I believe uh, the whites are gonna be the, the concave and then the blacks are gonna be the convex. So you're gonna be able to, again, know where the edges are. So if you've ever used the metal edgeware tool inside of Substance, you need to have a curvature map to know where those edges are. Otherwise, the generator doesn't work as, as intended. You could also export this and use it as a mask or as some sort of multiplier out there on the on the engines or in the, on the softwares. Uh, however, most of the times we are gonna be using this inside of Substance. We don't usually export this one. Position map, it's again, a little bit more situational. It's a, it's a map that tells us where the object is. If the object is close to the ground, up in the sky, to the right, to the left. Why would this be useful? Well, imagine we're texturing like a big scene, like an abandoned street and there's like trash cans and, and hydrants and uh, cars and stuff. And you wanna add like a mud layer to everything and you just drop the mod layer, and if you properly calibrate things, it will check what the position for all of the objects of the scene are, and it will only add the mod on the objects that are close to the ground. So if you have like a skyscraper or like a flag, you're not gonna have any, any mod over there because they're far away from the, for, from the floor. And again, this is why we need the position map. And finally, the thickness map, um, it's a super, super helpful map, so especially for organic th things. Thickness map will tell us which parts of the object are thicker or thinner. So especially helpful for subsurface scattering effects, for organic things, uh, for things that we want to create like different like variations. It allows us to know again where things are thin or thick, and um, it's really really helpful for um, again for for organic elements. So that's the basics of mesh maps, okay? So remember, we talked about this a couple of minutes ago. Mesh maps are maps that will gather information from our models. It can be the high poly and the low poly. And we will use those maps to properly generate different effects inside of, uh, inside of, the, of the substance uh, interface. By the way, we also use all of these maps inside of the Marmoset. If you check the Marmoset course, when we talk about the bakers, there are a couple of maps that we extract from those as well, and uh, and we generate this information. So I'm just gonna hit Bake Selected, and as you can see, now my mask has a lot more information in it, and uh, we're gonna have a like a nicer looking model. Okay. So as we mentioned, like if I were to add like let's say, just super basic, let's say we add like a wood uh, texture. Let's use this like wood walnut. There we go. Let's not break my rule and let's. Uh, Rotate this 90 degrees. There you go. So most of the things are going in the right direction. And now let's say I just want to add like a like a rust layer. I know that wood doesn't rust, but just uh, as a dirt layer kind of. So we're just going to add this. I'm going to say black mask, right click, add generator, and we're going to add a dirt generator. So the dirt knows where to go. It knows that it needs to go inside of the crevices of all of the different objects because it has the information from the mesh maps, okay? So the mesh maps are, are feeding information to that uh, specific things, okay? Give me just one second. Sorry about that, I had to uh, check something. <laughs> Uh, very quickly over there. So yeah, so again, the dirt knows where it's supposed to go thanks to the mesh, mesh maps. And you can actually take a look here on the on the generator and you're gonna see that it is using this input. It's using the curvature, the ambient occlusion, the world space normal, and the position. All of these maps are feeding information into the object so that we can properly um, see how things are looking, okay? That's mesh maps. So let's get rid of this thing right here. And now let's talk about 
the like texture maps okay texture maps are the ones that we are actually building on top of the whole thing and texture maps are super important because we're going to be using something called a pvr workflow physically based render workflow and this means that all of the textures that we create should be calibrated physically based or we're using the, the physical world as a reference so that no matter where we place our objects it can be inside of a cave on a castle on the outside like on a field or something doesn't matter where we place our objects, they will always behave in the, in the like physically exact way. So for instance, right now, this is a basic wood material that we have right here. Let's go for another one. Let me try like this iron rust. There we go. So this iron rust material, as you can see, a little bit too extreme. <laughs> let's, let's increase the scale and I'm going to go into the height map. It's a little bit too much. There we go. So it's like a rusted metal, okay? So if I were to go over here to the options and the display settings, let's turn on the opacity and let's turn down the blur. Right now, my Aku Aku mask is in the middle of a field and you can see that the metal right here and the rust and everything, it's it's behaving properly. It looks good, it looks interesting. Uh, we can move the light around and it will react to the light in a proper way. So things are looking nice. And if I were to change this to let's say this one right here to like this Mars desert, it's also gonna look good. And if I were to change this to like a cave, it's also gonna behave properly because all of the textures and the materials are calibrated in such a way that they react properly to the whole thing, okay? I know this is information that most of you already know, but I just wanted to touch base again and make sure that um, if you're new to the channel, well, we also do or go over basic stuff every now and then. So yeah, that's the basics of the, of the mesh maps. Now, there are four main uh, mesh maps that we're gonna be using. That's the diffuse, the metalness, the roughness and the normal map, which you can find over here. So color, metal, roughness, normal, and height. So right now, this guy right here is using or is activating all of those five channels. I'm actually gonna be using another one. Let me go and grab, um, which one will be a nice one? Like uh, this one, like pl plastic fabric. Let's, let's take a look at how this looks. Uh, maybe that's a little bit too complex. Let's, let's use something a little bit more basic. Um, yeah, like the wood American. I think this one's, it's a great one. So there we go. So we can rotate this around so it looks a little bit better. There we go. So the wood American right now, like this texture that we're using has four values that it's injecting onto my textures. It is applying color, metalness, roughness, and height, okay? So the color, simple. Everyone can understand that the color of the object is literally the color that we see. So if we want like a dark wood, we're gonna go for like a dark wood. If we want like very light wood, we can go over here and we can move around our color and find like the exact same tone of wood that we want, any color that you can imagine on the color spectrum, right? So that's again, fairly easy to understand. The roughness is the first principle that gets a little bit technical. Roughness is how light reacts to the surface of the object. So if an object has a very rough surface, light will scatter or it will well, scatter is not the right word it would um uh, diffuse is that the word no it would just bounce in a very weird way let me let me showcase here with a small drawing so if you have a surface and it's perfectly smooth like a mirror you would expect all of the rays of light to bounce in a super like predictable way right however if you have the same surface but it's really rough like a really old and damaged mirror the rays of light are going to start uh, bouncing in very unexpected ways. And what's going to happen is the amount of light that it reflects, it's the same. In this case, as you can see, three rays are coming in, three rays are coming out. Same thing here. However, the, the clarity, or I like to say the quality of the reflection will change. So depending on how rough the surface of an object is or the material of an object is, that's how, how the light is going to be like interacting with the object, okay? So right now, as you can see, we have a roughness of 0.37. So that means that it's a little bit rough, right? If we were to push this like really, really, really high, you're gonna see that the object becomes really mad. Why? Because all of the light is, is like bouncing in super crazy ways and we're not getting any specific like clear reflection. And if we were to bring this all the way down over here to like a, a zero roughness, you're gonna see that this looks perfectly, perfectly reflective. So every single uh, like ray of light is reflecting in a super predictable way. Okay, so roughness, I like to call it the quality in uh, on how the light bounces from the object, okay? That's the that's the like uh, easiest way for me to explain it in, in simple terms. Now, there's another property that we don't have right here, which is the metallic property. So let me turn this off again. Let's add another. Let's just add a basic blast plastic material. There we go. So as you can see, this is a basic blue plastic material. If I bring the roughness down, 
It's a very shiny material. You can see how uh, the light is reflecting in a very nice quality, in a perfect quality. So we can pretty much see the reflection of the of the environment on the eyes and on the different parts of the, of the character, right? However, if we start increasing the roughness, that uh, shininess or that like glossiness uh, goes down, diminishes. And actually roughness and glossiness, they're very similar terms. They're inversely proportionate or proportionally inverse. I think that's the way you say it. Um, which means that if you bring the roughness up, the glossiness is going down. And if you bring the glossiness up, the roughness is going down. So if at any point you have an engine or a software that is using glossiness instead of roughness, just invert your map and you're going to have the exact same result. Okay. So yeah, the more roughness the, or the more rough the object is, the less light uh, bounces in a nice way. And the lower the roughness, the shinier or, or more reflective the object is going to be in this way. The other value, this is again, remember, we mentioned four values, right? Dorm, uh, diffuse or color, metalness, roughness, and finally, uh, normal. So the next value is the metallic, and that tells us if uh, the object is metallic or not. So in this case, uh, if I were to grab this guy and bring it all the way up, now this material is going to behave like a metallic material. And this is because we're using a, a type of uh, shading, like... Um, workflow that is called PBR metallic uh, roughness, okay? So so we use metallic to say if an object is metallic or not, and then with the roughness, we define how shiny or not the object is, either if it's a, a metal or like not a metal. If you were using a more exact um, workflow, like the specular glossiness, then you're gonna have to go into more specific numbers because the specularity is a value that every single thing in the world has, and you're gonna have, a th you're gonna have to find the exact specular value for each object. So. The specularity glossiness workflow, which is one that comes in pretty much every render as well, it's a little bit more exact, but a little bit more technical to, to set up properly. This one, the metallic roughness, was actually conceived to help us artists that don't want to mess around with like specific values and just get something that looks good. So it's a little bit more intuitive, I would, I would say. So if you have a very metallic object with a very low roughness, you're going to see this, like a chrome ball. And of course, we will need to have this as a white object if we want this to be chrome. Uh, we go black, we're not going to see much, right? So we do need to have some sort of like reflection on the color. And we can, of course, at any point, uh, change this metallic from metallic to non-metallic. And now this is just like a plastic object, okay? So those are the mesh maps. The final one that I'm missing is the normal map. Uh, and this is going to be dependent on specific textures. Not all of the textures are going to have a normal map, uh, but the normal map will add extra detail to the object. Like for instance, this one right here, the iron diamond. So if I were to add this guy right here and let's repeat this thing, you're going to see that it looks like uh, now there's like more detail on the object. And the reason why there's more detail is because you were using this height information. Now you're probably going to wonder, well, you just mentioned normal, why, why height? In Substance Painter, most of the height information gets automatically converted into normal information once you export. So talking about height and normal inside of S Substance Painter is very similar, okay? So yeah, this is the, um, those are the maps and I can show you right here, I can turn off all of the channels except for the height map and you're gonna see that we're gonna have that information which eventually, I'm gonna press the letter C, I can jump into the channels and I can jump into that normal channel and look at that. So all of that information is being stored on the normal channel. So all of this is not existent. This detail does not exist, but it will it will make the engine think that the detail is actually there and it will shade it as such. Now I can actually go here to the eye ray, which is uh, substances uh, like ray tracing render. And you can see that it looks like this thing has all of this diamond shapes, even though I know that the geometry does not have that information, okay? Now, and here's where I'm gonna do a little bit of a segue for tomorrow's video. Sometimes you will be exporting height information and using it to create something called a displacement map. Now, we've talked about displacement before. We actually used them in the grenade tutorial a couple of months ago, but let's make a, or let's have a little bit of a refresher on displacement maps. We're going to be talking about those ones tomorrow. For today, uh, this is it, guys. I just want to give you a quick rundown of mesh maps. Hopefully you uh, got the idea and uh, texture maps. So two different sets of maps, all of them useful. The, the mesh maps are useful to generate the texture maps, and then the texture maps are the ones that we actually export. And hopefully with all of this explanation, you now have a little bit of a better understanding of what each of those maps do on our final texture. If you don't, don't worry, leave me some comments and I'll be happy to read them uh, again for you, okay? So yeah, that's it. And uh, actually for tomorrow, I have a small uh, little surprise. We're not gonna be using Maya. We're gonna jump into Blender. I'm gonna show you some of the small things I've learned as well. So yeah, uh, hang on tight and I'll see you back tomorrow. Bye-bye.